Uh, hello, everybody. I am Emma Ridgeway, and we are delighted to be with you this evening for a conversation with Marina Abramovich. Here at Modern Art Oxford, we have the exhibition Gates and Portals, which has only the rest of this week to run, and it's an extraordinary exhibition experience if you have not been to the space before or if you're intending to visit yet again. As you know, Marina Abramovich is one of the best known and most certainly pioneering conceptual performance artists in the world. It's a real delight to work with her in the way in which she creatively stretches what she does and how she does it in testing the limits both of herself as an artist and us as viewers too. We'll watch a short video together, which is about the exhibition at Modern Art Oxford. And then Marina and I will speak for about 30 minutes and you can ask questions in the YouTube chat. And I will read some of those questions for Marina to respond to for the last kind of 10 minutes of this conversation. So let's first watch a short video. <laughs> Okay, take one. You have to give me your time and I can give you experience. In the first room, we have seven magnet structures, seven gates. Without sound, they're concentrated to what they're going to see and what they're going to experience. Kind of silence, kind of in-between space that you can really collect yourself. We ask real trust from the public. We ask facilitators to take your hand and to move you through the space. In the next door, you have portal. So this portal is made with selenites and produce very, very bright light. So this is a kind of experience of change. You go from darkness to light. I didn't want to be a celebrity. It's the public put me in that position. And this really actually completely break their own concentration on their own personal experience. So I become obstacle to my own work. I see removing myself from this is very important. This is just a new phase in my life. The really change came with artists is present. I spent three months, you know, 715 hours sitting on the chair without motion. I understood how bubbly much need to be part of something. And then I realized when I stood up from the chair that my work right now is the public. public now is ready to be part of it, to actually experience it in a very direct way. The first time I came to do the performance in the museum, it was a piece called Dragon Head. And then later on in 1995, I came with full exhibition here in Oxford. This time I'm here again with another kind of exhibition based on research at Pete Rivers Museum and it's called Gates and Portals. In so many ancient cultures, there is so many gates and portals, different divisions between good and bad, paradise and hell, between life and death. The portals is really going through something that you change your consciousness, you step into a different state of mind, or you go between life and death. I studied the past, I can really create the future. As much time you invest, as much experience you get. Because the moment you open yourself, it's emotional. It's a work, it's a work on yourself. The only change can be done if you make your own personal journey. And this exhibition is about own personal journey. People should not be afraid of their own emotions. They should really go for it. So that gave you just some taste of the exhibition experience, which is pretty unique that's currently on in Oxford. And I first want to ask Marina to describe a little the experience of this exhibition and about the transition from her working with her own body and her whole being in her own body and instead inviting the visitor and the viewer to have their body as the central focus of the work? You know, 
the journey starts more than 50 years ago when, you know, I just realized as a very young kid that actually all what I want to do is art. And I start with the painting, very simple. And what I was painting, I was painting my dreams because I was a kid. I go to sleep, I paint, I dream the dream, and then I paint it. And then later on became much more and more and more elaborate. But there is one moment in my life that actually I realized that being in the studio and painting something two-dimensional is not really enough. I was thinking how I can actually expand this experience, how I can use the body, how I can use fire, air, um, earth, uh, uh, the temperature, cold, hot, uh, how I can push the body limits and how I can use my own body. And when this experience was so strong, when I was start in front of the public, that I could never go back in its seclusion of the studio. And this is how my performance work was born. And then became such a long, long process where actually, as I said already in the video, you know, Artists' Present was the first time that I realized it's not just me who have to make the change, it's the public too. And this is how I came this Abramovich method in life and how the actually Gates and Portals exhibition, you know, been developed, where actually the public have their own personal experience. Yeah, and to give some indication of the exhibition experience, which that video hinted at. So we have these wonderful facilitators who are trained in the Abramovich method. Would you talk a bit about that personal journey that people are invited to make? You know, uh, first of all, as I said again, also in this short video, the public was just watching before we talk, is that I became obstacle to my own work because the moment I will be in the space, people will come around me and start attracting to take selfies or have signed some books and so on, which is not the purpose of the show. The purpose is really how you get with very open mind into this space where you have immediately you read the concept, you put your headphones, which block the sound, you leave your, your belongings like a wall is like a phone, it's like a computer way, so you don't have any technology around you, and you go to see how this experience is going to lead you. The the facilitate was an extremely important component of the show, and they've been trained spe specifically for that purpose, because the facilitators is the one who actually facilitate you the experience by guiding you very gently, very very kind of with lots of tenderness and being humble at the same time and show you, you know, which steps you have to take at the time. When you arrive in the space, you know, bring you to the gates, when you have to stand on the on the on this construction, which is made from copper and magnets for a certain amount of time. You have to face the wall. You have to go from there to another space where you just, just sit blindfolded in silence. Then you go to the to the final space where you can, you know, you can lie down and wait when it's the right moment to go through the portal, which is again about the idea of luminosity, going through the light, going to change, you know, the the the, the kind of state of mind. Because I always believe that actually dying is never going to darkness, it's always going to light. So this kind of the kind of transition of the stage. And as they been also, you know, study entire months in Pete Rivers Museum and look into this all ideas of how ancient cultures deal with gates and portals was so interesting. There is always different different rituals involved and based on repetition and so on. And also the main thing in this show is time that you have to spend in the show. Mm. You can't have experiences three seconds. You can't experience if you talk to somebody. You can't experience if you're texting or taking photographs from your mobile. You have to be there with your mind and the body in real time, here and now. Yeah, and when we talked, when we were shaping the show and thinking about it at an early stage, we talked about that need to surrender oneself to the experience, essentially, which isn't something that we very often do, particularly in a more public space with people we don't know. And that vulnerability and trust and going into an encounter is an enormous part of how you conduct your performance. And it's a huge part of um, this exhibition as well. Um, would you speak to that? <laughs> it's, it's so many, it's so interesting. You know, first of all, 
you know, we're talking also the British mentality and British culture generally. They they are very reserved. They don't do just to open the self. They they really drink a lot to do that. But generally in real life, you know, <laughs> reserved, very very proper, you know, and. Uh, and they don't like to anybody tell them what to do, especially not to say to them, just lie down or look the wall or do this or do that. They immediately, there is resistance. And it's all about opening, opening. And it's all about actually say, okay, I'm going to see the show. And this show is going to, you know, give me something different new. And to order to receive this different new, let's be open to experiment. And if you don't have this attitude, you can't, you can't. I mean, I, I mean, I don't want to say the name, but the very prominent guardian critic came to see the show, went to the portals, lie on the bed and fall asleep. And then wrote terrible critic that, you know, and I think that he really missed the whole point. I would like so much to get to him again and bring him to the show and say, okay, let's go one more time. Let's see what, if you really open yourself, could be maybe different approach. But this is how people are. I, I remember really well, I was in Staley Museum, was my first show with transitory objects. And I remember two people sitting on the wall, on, you know, in, in these transitory objects in this very kind of quiet position. And they're both Americans. And one looked to each other and they say, I'm sitting here since five minutes. Do you feel anything? He said, not a thing. So let's go for hamburger. And that's, you know, that's how, you know, you can not have any experience. The time is, is incredibly important because you have to, you have to figure out that that only when you give certain time to things that things can reveal to you, not before. Because you know, if you're there five or six minutes, you, you your concentration, who knows where it is? You need you need to kind of arrive in the space, you have to arrive into the atmosphere of that. You have to trust the, the, the facilitators that this experiment is very safe. It's 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 just it's just only what they ask you. The, the participant and the public is time and open yourself and then see what happens. And that's really something that lots of resistance, you know, I will, I have, you know, generally, and I will probably have in the future till something changes, something happened. But there is a beautiful statement of John Cage who said, you know, every time I, I, I invent something and um, the public immediately accept it, I have to move to the to the field where where it's not where they don't accept. So you always have to go a little bit forward in order to kind of um, create the experience that that people understand in in the future. Because more and more we lost our center of concentration. More and more we we really don't have any attention. Even before fifteen seconds of Coca Cola, you know, advertising is too long now for the kids. Kids are not looking one program on television without zipping constantly. The all life is emojis and text messages. You know, that's the reality. This is why I think more and more to go back to simplicity is very important. Yeah, and it's been interesting seeing visitors in the space, and obviously I've done the experience a few times myself as well, and found that because you have the sound taken away from you and responsibility for even where you're moving and when you're moving in the space is lifted from you as a responsibility. So it's very much about sitting with your own emotions and just being in the space and learning to just be present and take responsibility for that within oneself. And it's interesting doing it at different times. You notice different things come up and the levels of meaningfulness within it as well. You can kind of generate in terms of what you might be conceiving or thinking of in terms of the event of going through the selenite portal and the light of that and we've had lots of feedback from visitors, which we invite as well. And um, sort of over 90% of that has been exceedingly positive in terms of people finding it such an unusual and interesting thing to do, to go into a silent space and to be physically guided in the space. But in terms of one's own interiority, to actually spend time with that and just notice what comes up. Some people have come numerous times because they find it so kind of cleansing in terms of being able to sort of cleaning the house as a phrase that uh, Marina you used so I think as an experience as an exhibition and a, an experiment and exhibition making as well which really takes conceptual art 
into a very, in some ways abstract, but in other ways, essentialist kind of idea of if in conceptual art, there's the concept and the viewer's own subjectivity is part of the aesthetic experience. So how you encounter that and understand that. This, with the artist's intention, the object that helps convey that and the subjectivity of the individual, this is all very amplified in this exhibition. And <clears throat> with the aspiration to kind of increase the sensitivity of the visitor as well, we did talk, Marina, about at the Pitt Rivers Museum, there's also a wonderful display, and that shows some things from the residency. And they have also, um, as Claire Harris and the team at Pitt Rivers Museum, done a beautiful kind of trail where you can find some of the objects that you uh, engaged with when you were doing your research residency. Would you talk about the research residency, which was in summer 2021 a bit, and how some of the ideas from that fed in? to this exhibition too? You know, the Pitt Rivers Museum is like my old friend because the first time I went to Pitt Rivers Museum, it was in the 90s, where actually I had a show also in the Museum of Modern Art for the first time, when I show mostly the transitory objects and, and the new work, you know, the, the clean, the mirror, and also some and the work that I've been doing research in Pitt Rivers Museum. But the interesting thing is that that Petrius Museum is like, to me, like, like you know, like a, kids go to the secret treasure. I go there and I <laughs> lose myself because it's like this museum can be can be millions of museums because just from the five drawers so they have in one corner, there's so much richness there and so much uh, kind of the, the interesting journeys and in so many ways of so culture, so my, mysticism or rituals, so the, you know, the, the different, the, the, types of, of tribes all around the world. This amazing collection is, Tweet Rivers is unique, absolutely. There's no any of the museums similar to that. And so my second residency, I was so happy. It was like, a, I was like, a, you know, like a dream to do research. So I had the, the Claire Harris, actually, she was on sabbatical. I had her at the office. She gave me the room, which I really completely took it over. I have the millions of the books, you know, that, that the sisters would bring to me to research whatever I want. I could open every drawer. I could, you know, the the the, the curator, Nicholas, was there, who open every, every drawer for me and say, oh, you want? this one and then I will look into this and then we we talk about and we know the rituals so I was very drawn to the especially Siberian section and some you know Tibetans and uh, you know and some other 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 sections there you know medieval and really to understand how the portals how the gates have been treated in different cultures and to understand as much as possible and then I um I, um, the, my first trip to Pit Rivers, which I've done, is that I will ask them to give me 12 objects who are highly secret and with really potential energy that will bring them on the on the plate in the in the gloves and put it on the table. And I will just hold my hands over the objects to feel that kind of energy of what's happening in this object. And then my second visit, I I done with different objects again, but in this time I would not just call the hand over the, the object itself, but the object will be removed. And I will call the hand over the empty space where the object was just standing before. That was mind blowing for me, the, really to understand how the emptiness can connect, collect energy of the object itself. How we, human body, you know, I can sit on the chair and move the, away from the chair, but my energy is still on the chair. So understand this kind of invisible reality. And uh, that all, you know, the connection with also museum and Pitt Rivers Museum, really, uh, we create, a very, very, very excited about the book we make, which is called Gates and Portals, with the different texts, which you beautiful interview with Claire Harris interview with some, you know, expert excerpts from the, the, the some writings that, that we find interesting. So this is like a little research book with my drawings of the, of the objects that I was drawn. And um, 
But that's, that was like an incredible kind of, for me, special journey. And this book I like because it's not something that you normally read from beginning to the end. You can take any time, any time during the years and open any page and you find something that you, you didn't see before. And really the kind of research journey. And this is what Peter Rivers does. And I hope to come again because for me it's endless. The, one of the systems, the way how I work there, I will arrive in Peter's museum and I will not look any object. I will just kind of stroll through the space, going up and down. And I have to actually feel that something is behind me or he called me or catch my eye. And the first thing catch my eye, this was this, that I see something is behind me. And I turn, and this was this huge sculpture of the woman, very kind of voluminous and made out of stone. And I look, you know, finally what it is. And the, the scriptures say it's Baba from Ukraine. And this is the sculptures they 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 they're very common in the in the East Europe and um, in in that area. And I was like, I like I saw my grandmother. I got so familiar with that. And and then I made some beautiful drawings of that Babas. And at the same time, in the book I used for the first time Cyrillic language, which I never did before. So it was a really interesting journey. And it was an interesting journey how this connected with the would actually show that you need for the public is ask same sensitivity, same kind of openness to feel energy, you know. And some people really did it and some yeah. not. But it's interesting that I had a much more more stronger positive <clears throat> response with the public than with critics. Critics was like you know they came there to criticize. They came there you know to see things and they go away. They didn't came there with open mind and that's how things are but to me response of public is very important because i made this for the public not for the critics yeah and the um so this is the publication it's absolutely lovely cardboard publication and one of the things that's uh, gorgeous about it is it has these sections of these are some of the drawings that marina did as part of her research this is a really open lovely way to show you open, sorry open. <laughs> Open I'm, one. Going to, I'm, trying, I'm open. trying to do without dropping the book, but so this is a, this is a, I draw mm -hmm. which leather, <laughs> which leather who is made of the rope and the white mm -hmm. like feathers that's supposed to witches to you know to climb up you know in the, to go to visit spirit world, and uh, they brought to me this leather and I draw exactly the size. The, the original size of the leather. And I made the, the video installation. Petrovic Museum was still on that you can see. Yeah, and that's on um, for a good number of weeks, actually. It's a really beautiful presentation at the Pit Rivers and well worth um, going to see. That extraordinary University of Oxford Museum and Marina's work is well placed centrally in that as well. I only want to say one more thing that is such important that the uh, the Oxford Museum with Peter Rivers Museum collaborate because they're two totally different museums. One is really mm -hmm. ecological, and one is is for the that's this is my babas here, <laughs> the one before. But anyway, it's it's really about modern art. But actually, the collaboration is brings such a new new views, you know, on these two different aspects. Yeah. Of, you know. Absolutely. And that collaboration between the two spaces, of course, because of the willing and the interest um, between the different collaborating parties and people. And both spaces, whilst they seem utterly different, one is a world-renowned space full of extraordinary um, anthropological collection. And the space here, which does has no collection and the invitation to artists is always quite an expanded invitation when it's a large solo exhibition of what would you like to do experimentally that you wouldn't normally do and to stretch practice in that way so one super full space and one super empty space but both exceedingly interested in ideas how different belief systems manifest in different ways and what is it to be human really through different kind of understandings could I ask Marina as well just to um, go back to much earlier in your work as well? Most people are very familiar with or at least familiar with some of your performance works. And 
There's certain works early on in your practice as well, thinking around 1973, some of the works, which like the Gates and Porter's exhibition in some ways, they're works where there's just an object in the space and the assumption is very much and the intention is very much for the audience to notice their own thoughts and thinking. So I'm thinking of, for example, the sound environment that was white and just had an audio recording of your voice saying something exceedingly um, thought-provoking for anybody. Would you speak about that piece? Oh, you know, the, first of all, it's really interesting that I actually start doing sound pieces and with sound piece brought me to performance, which I include in my body too. But in the beginning, it was really just sound works. And I've done several sound works before I actually start performing. The one, you know, we, we had this uh, student cultural center that it was a building given by Tito after big demonstrations in 1968. And their center is have the gallery, have the big, uh, big um, the, the, the amphitheater to show the movies and so on, library and the big um, cafeteria space. And we all would go there and discuss the art, drink the coffee all day long. And it was kind of space that, of meeting. But at the same time, it was the time that you could never go anywhere because nobody had the money. It's not politically that we could not travel. It was the country was pretty flexible, but we just could not uh, leave because there was no any kind of possibility to travel. So I put the tape, the the speaker. Uh, all over this big space with my own voice recording saying that, um, you know, the please all the passengers of the yacht, which is Yugoslav airline can leave immediately to the gate 345, which was completely illusion because we only have the two gates and the plane is leaving now to, to uh, Tokyo, uh, Bangkok and Hong Kong. And then, and then every three, four minutes, this urgency voice come that you have to go to the gate. So this was like a, how I can say, change one environment into aeroport, into some kind of place that you can take this imaginary trip with, in the places that you never can reach. And this was the call aeroport, you know, sound environment. I was really happy with this because I always want to go to these places. Later on, I did. But that time, this was like a dream. Then there was another very sick little tree in the front of this student cultural center with like few leaves. And I put the speaker there with the normal sounds of the tropic birds. And it was so amazing. Like you know, this little tree was producing this sound of the of the jungle in the middle yeah. of the city. So that was another piece. And then I was interested in more in more conceptual aspect. Um, and I wanted to make the work that I put the speakers on the bridge with the sound of the bridge falling down. But to do that, I so you stand on the bridge, you see the bridge is there, but the sound, the bridge collapsing in that moment. So to have this, this two kind of contrast of feeling. And this was, of course, before war or anything in the early 70s. And I remember that I... Um, I went to ask, you know, city council for, for permission. I was absolutely refused because they say actually for vibrations, bridge can really fall down. And I made it this in my own building, which the, in only for a few minutes, and everybody was thinking the building is collapsing as earthquake. And I had a huge problem with my mother, my father, all the people there living. It was like a mess. But the, actually, the one of this um, installation I recreate in the museum in Oxford called the Sound Corridor, the War. This was in 90, I built this in 1971, like almost prediction of the Balkan War much later. And the sound was like you go through the corridor with the machine guns and you are kind of literally getting killed through the machine guns, you know, conceptually, and you enter to the other side. But the idea was not really in a kind of classic way war. And the idea was, is that when you enter to the exhibition space or in the gallery or from one space from outside the wall to one inside, you are so full of ideas or, you know, your mind is somewhere else, you're not concentrated. So that kind of sound empty you. You're literally killed in order to receive. And then you come very empty on the other side and really could receive art in a kind of pure way. So this was like, a, the, the, actually, that was like a cleaning up idea through the sound. Mm. And there was the piece there, wonderful to hear about. Thank you. And it's um, not always known that area of your practice and the sound work and how seminal it is. And in terms of very much having the visitor's own understanding of the, the 
viewer or the residents in your building, <laughs> that emotionality that it provokes in people is something that's very much returned to in gates and portals. There's one work I remember um, you saying about as well, which was a audio recording of you saying, I love you, I love you on repeat, which is just a wonderful idea. Oh, this was like actually the the empty tape was going through all space and amplifying the white sound, which was not anything, but only on the one tiny little part of the tape was I love you. So you can go into the into into room and that thing can not happen that comes exactly I love you on the on the playing. So you will go out and you just hear nothing, like empty sound. But you come in or maybe just then they say I love you. Or maybe you go out and say I love you. Or in the middle. You, it's all unpredictable. So it's which I like um, this unpredictable that kind of emotional statement. I love you. You can you can experience or not. And another thing that I done in the in the museum also I just put a lots of white papers with the pencils and I declare this is the forest. Please you know walk and sit and breathe and write your feelings about the forest. And I got every day museum would change papers. People really get into this, into this actually mood that if I tell you this is the forest, I'm an artist, believe this is the forest. So they really accept it. There's a very old piece. I don't remember, I think Tony Craig made in Italian. No, the, the English artist. He had a two, long time ago, conceptual piece. He had the two glasses of water, exactly same looking. Like I have one like this. So then mm -hmm. we took the next one. And on the one glass of water was written glass of water. On another one's written oak tree. And that was the, this was the piece of photographic work. I love that because if I, if you see it's glass of water, fine. But if an artist tell you this is oak tree, there's no question, this is oak tree. So if I tell you this is the forest, this is a forest. And I love that kind of, of the commitment of the public, you know, to go to this world of an artist. Truly, it's a really wonderful um, piece to give an example of as well. The, the oak tree piece was one of the things that got me into art when I was a teenager. It was Take Liverpool had opened up and it was being shown on the telly. And um, they gave that as an example of the kind of art that they were showing. And I was a teenager at the time in North I Lancashire. Have another, I have another, another piece that I love from this period. Mm but I don't know who was an artist. It's very simple. It's a white piece of paper. There was at the time Xerox was very fashionable. So there was a white piece of paper put on the Xerox machine and press copy. And the, they came out another white piece of paper. And then oh. these two pieces of paper, was it was framed. One was original and one was the copy. Action. <laughs> I love that original and the copy of two completely plain white paper. White paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that playfulness with ideas that are kind of, you know, often quite philosophical ideas that could be written into deep, dense tomes of texts. But often in art, they're done in joyful, playful ways that are about just opening things up and thinking in a really flexible way, which is a real joy. And it's something I very, very much enjoy about your work and your way of working, because behind the scenes, what people may not be aware of is um, we've worked together previously on a project in Reykjavik as well, many moons ago. One of the ways in which you personally work as an artist is with an openness and a flexibility and a creative responsiveness. So things that could be challenges, there's always constraints in projects, there's always difficulties that necessarily come up. And of your many qualities, one of the things that's so extraordinary and wonderful is that you just leap into that situation to go, oh, we could try, should we try this? And just this, it opens up creative responses rather than shuts things down or throws things off course. Could you talk I a little to, about I that attitude to, in your life? I love, I love to talk about this because I always admire surrealist. I always admire Picabia, the Dadaist, the Futurist, all of these people who was having these groups in, in the past who had so much joy. 
of the being together and doing crazy stuff, you know, doing the movies, doing the manifestos, uh, working, uh, working around, you know, just not always considered own work, but also creating the group work. That group work was like a, like a, like a, like a step to completely new area of experiments, which was so necessary how the art progress and how change and become it become what it is, you know, including Marcel Duchamp. All of them, they play. And we mm. forgetting that because we're looking, this art became so much commodity, so much different, completely something else is happening, which is not healthy. We lost the humor, we lost playfulness, and we lost togetherness. You know, the artists come together and they don't, they, you, you don't need to make great work. You need to make playful work. And that playful work maybe become great, but doesn't matter. The process is so important. And this is to me incredible, you know, to add to that, that, that thing that, that is, that these people really teach us. We should look in the past and look how much fun they had. And we we don't we everybody is like you know having his own tower and not in, not you know I come from east and we been so much discussing art and being together and working in, as a groups and when I came to the west it's always lost you know people are so individual and you know scared from their own creativity which is pretty mm. yeah that that playfulness is part of being present and connected in life as well. And I'd say as well, what I've seen in your way of working is when things come up, there's just an acceptance of that and it gets included into the creative process. I have to say, you know, also failure. For me, failure is so important. Failure is the biggest teacher in my life because when you're going to do an experiment and you never try and you're in the front of the public, you have no idea it's going to be the worst thing ever made or it's going to be something amazingly new. But you have to be open to fail. And I remember, I'm not going to tell you which piece, but it was one piece. It was one of the most shitty and most horrible and most, oh my God, so bad. And I didn't know because we, I don't rehearse. I never rehearse. I only create the idea and see what happened. And uh, the moment I was in the front of the public and I was doing it, I knew it's like, oh, what the hell I'm doing? And I could not stop. I did it to the end. I went straight home and just get sick for three weeks. And then, you know, I stand up and I make another piece much better. But that's important, you know, to try things and fail and try again and stand up and do it again. You know? Yeah. Thank you. And there's a question that's come through. So I'm going to ask you this. This is from Antonio, which is, are you talking about something like a non-religious spiritual space? So this is a good question to gates and portals and oh my god this is a great question by the way i don't really interested in religion i never been for me looking in the in a culturally historically religion is always about power about manipulation is about the 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 the, the violence is about war so many wars been made because of religion and so on so i'm really talking about independent space with the spiritual space that's totally something else Really, yes, spiritual space. Mm -hmm. And the follow-up question is portals to where? Sorry, what is the portal portals to where? Question mark. So where are the portals oh, leading ah. to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that depends from you where you need to go. But the portal is it's 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 really like like a met metaphor for going from A to B, going from the life to that, going to the, from darkness to light. I mean, all of this, you know, depends really what you want it to be. I, I have a, in my Abramovich method, this really funny exercise, which I invent, which I'm very actually happy with this. It's just opening the door very slowly. You open the door, you're not exiting. You're closing the door, you're not entering. Just, the, just this function, opening, closing the door, as slow as possible, three hours. After a certain amount of time, door is not the door anymore. Door is 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 a cosmos. Door is the space of the consciousness that you actually did not exist. So portal is similar. It's like that, you know. It's yeah. you, you have to be in yourself, and that will bring you wherever you have to go. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. What a nice so, questions I'm having. I'm like yeah, there's some more coming through. It's wonderful. Um, so this is the next question. 
My name is Nick, and I'm thrilled to have experienced Gates and Portals before I had, had, had before I headed to Barcelona to experience the seven deaths of Maria Callas. Just how would you? Oh my God! I'm mm-hmm. going yeah. yeah. Um, how would you define the space between you and your thoughts? In my thinking process. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So you yourself, identity, I'd imagine, and your thoughts that wow this is something i have to think about it's not easy question to it's really because it's true you know you have a there there's so many different levels of thinking you know you could have a just very ordinary self when you just think about daily situations you embarrass or you're angry of some kind of daily events or or too much work or you're reading something all this kind of thinking process i'm not paying much attention for me this is so important when i can enter into kind of higher level of self which i call you know it's you actually have to empty yourself of the thinking in order to get something which I call the the liquid knowledge. This is mm. my, my my own statement. Liquid knowledge is coming, the knowledge is everywhere around us, but you have to tune to that knowledge. It, they come like, a, like it's outside. And to, to tune to that knowledge, you have to empty your ordinary thinking. And then you get into that type of thinking, which is creative, which is the one who tell you the truth, which is the one who deals with intuition, which is the one who, who deals with the with the um, how you call this synchronicity when you 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 are completely in balance? It doesn't come often, comes and goes. You know you can't maintain for a long time. But that's to me the space that I like to be. And there are the other ones which just you know, it's always there, but you don't actually care about. I mm. I hope I answer this question. Not easy. Yeah, very interesting question. And Winnie has asked a question which she says, um, hi, Marina, is there another museum that you'd also like to do the kind of research type project in, you did at the Pit Rivers, um, in Holland? Um, it's so enriching. Oh, I, I am the Royal Academy show, which is opening now 19 of September this year, is the next step is actually a Stadley Museum and is going to go to Stadley Museum and is going to open 15 of March 2024. And that museum actually will not just have a, the work of the Royal Academy, but they will have also the work that the public participating because Royal, Royal Academy does not have that part because they're already done in Oxford. But the Stanley Museum is requesting more participatory work that the large public can participate. So if you're Dutch, you can be there soon next year. And we have a question from Blanca who asks, uh, what's your favorite object in the pit rivers apart from the Baba? And how did you first encounter it? And why did you feel such a connection to it? Oh, I love this, this mystical dog. I call him mystical dog. I it's just a wooden dog, you know, but there's something with fierce of eyes. Oh, you ha- can you show this? This I have it in the book, in the little book. Oh, that's the mystical book. I love this one. I, there's something because I always feel he's like the king, the gatekeeper, you know. And there is some kind of energy of 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 probably ritual from the past that hold this 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 dog. This when I hold the hands around them, I really felt that there is a secret that we don't know. But that's one of my favorites, the mystical yeah. dog. Yeah beautiful little creature and we have another question which is how have your personal experiences uh, and or previous works inspired and contributed to the construction of gates and portals exhibition a lot you know i went through everything i could possibly mention my life I was looking backwards to my life i say oh my god this is too much even for me i just you know it's, it's first of all when I left Yugoslavia, ex-Yugoslavia, all what I want to do is to see the world. I want to see the cultures with nothing to do with my own culture. I remember going to Thailand to the market where I went to see just what they're selling it. And I have no idea 
I pick up things that I never saw in my life. Is the vegetables, are the animals, or the fruits, or whatever it is. I would take them to my hotel and call, kind of cut them to understand what is going on. And then, you know, and then I trips went to deserts because I went with Ulai with lots of deserts because for me it was so interesting that, the, you know, Buddha went to desert, Jesus went to desert, the Muhammad went to desert, all went there to desert, you know, as a nobody, I came back as a somebody. So it must be something in the deserts. So we went to desert to look for something. Then we end living with Australian Aborigines. Then I went to the Tibetan communities in many monasteries, do lots of retreats. Then I went to the to the, the Brazilian shamans. I learned from everything that I can learn from, but not as a tourist. Really go to the culture and stay for a long time in that culture and be part of that culture. And then learning because all my all idea of my life is being bridge. I go to the east to learn and then to the west to give. And um, it's so that all the gates and portals come from that knowledge, you know, that I learn and experience of myself. And that was based on my work. For every of the work, I prepare a lot, you know, and, and every performance takes a long time to actually execute it because you need really to understand your concentration, your willpower, your determination, your how the body works, where is your mind, where is your breathing, lots of things, not easy. Yeah. And on to the next questions, we have quite a few. Um, the next question is, thank you so much for this. In your past works, you've used your voice, then used your body. And in Gates and Portals, you intentionally removed yourself from the live performance. Will you perform live again? I don't know. Right now, I think, you know, first of all, I am performing opera, you know, which I directed and performing myself from the in the part of the of the opera, which are just going to be now in Barcelona. Opening is on the on the 9, 10, and 11, if anybody wants to come to see. Later on, the opera is going to also show in London. Uh, it's going to be the first week of December in the National Opera. So there I'm performing all the time. But at making the really different type of performance, like my kind of performances, I, I think I probably I will do a few before I, I leave this planet. But the, I'm very much interested in working with the public on the large scale, like, uh, you know, like really actually um, creating the system that I call Abramovich method with the public performing and I guiding them. Because I understood what we are missing in this whole performance, you know, issue is that that it's not enough that the performer goes to the experience. It's important that the public goes to experience. Public have to change in order to understand what we are doing. So that my all attention right now, the public become the work. And you know, one of the, the, the interaction with the public I done the large scale was in Lithuania last year. It was a stadium for 6,000 people. And I'm thinking now for the Royal Academy, we will have courtyard and I would like to do similar you know, in in in, uh, in London, see that's how it goes. You know, but that's what I'm doing right now. The public is the work, and the opera is well worth seeing. I had the great pleasure of seeing it when it was in Amsterdam, and it's really, it's a beautiful, unusual mix of ideas and ways of representing the voice and the dramatization of a honoring of uh, Maria Callas and um, yeah and it's great that it's coming to the UK so more people can see that but everybody was saying to me oh, why are you doing opera now and I say why not I done so much stuff in performance and opera is such an old old-fashioned the art medium and I say why not taking that and see what I can do with that I'm just like curious like a kid let's do opera I done one I don't think I would do another one one is enough mm. I I'm interested in exploring different things all the time. Mm. Um, there's a question, uh, actually, which is directed at me. I'll be brief. So the question is, Emma, what was your experience of curating the exhibition and what's your favourite room of the space? So there's a lot of different you people. Know who are... <laughs> um, I didn't make this up myself, I promise. Um, there's uh, there's lots of different people involved actually in the making of the exhibition um, as well. I should certainly credit in terms of Amy Burden, uh, Jess Robertson, and Dorman as well. Um, so, in terms of curating the exhibition, there's always a thousand components. It's an exhibition. I always particularly love in making shows that imagining, 
If we do this, how does that change the experience? If we put this quote here, does that make people think in this direction or that direction? So I really enjoyed that. It was good fun as well um, doing the install uh, with Marina uh, when she arrived and thinking through that space. And there's some objects that I just find really fascinating. The copper towers, which in photos look nice enough, they are beautiful in real life. They are elegant, tall structures. You can see them just there behind. And you can see one of the quotes we chose too. And the lovely headphones that you put on. And at the top of these copper towers, I think we might even have a close up that I took just quick on my iPhone, a snapshot. There's these beautiful magnets and they're two magnets together. And one is suspended. They're suspended on these tiny little bolts. So there we have it. So that's actually two big, strong magnets that are heavy. Suspended one on a tiny little bolt so it would fall if it wasn't held in place by the magnetic force of the other one. So one's just there from gravity, another there through the magnetic pull of the one above. So they're kind of the forces of the earth are holding them there. Copper's known for having extraordinary conductive properties. And that care and Marina's interest in materiality and creating very simple, elegant structures. And to, for us to think about the body and materiality, I found that really fascinating um, as well. So loads of uh, enjoyable, interesting bits in curating the exhibition. I'm going to jump onto the next question, which is from Alice Hackney. And she asks, what considerations do you take when creating a piece where visitors are so key? Great and portals can feel like it's made for one type of body. But how important is it that you create a universal experience? How important is to make what? Eh? I, um, how important is it to you to create a universal experience? So an experience that people, whatever form their body takes or their mobility yeah, is. The question, you know, here also function of art. It's so important, you know, art, you're not creative for yourself. Art you create, create for others. And, and it's very important. What's the message? What is the content? And what you like to do? And say with your art and my art is really always always considering audience you know to me in even talking about performance and transitory objects or crystals or the the portraits or gates it's always about you know uh, give possibility of the of the public to live the spirit and transform you know this was this is like a main message and I don't see that I should do anything that I will leave and never show with others. Everything is done for the public. The public is the is the is the main media, and with the public, my work get completed. Without public, it's just the objects without life. The public give them life. And. In terms of the spaces, Anna asks, how do you feel about the relationship between sounds and the spaces that hold them? But I, I, this, there's no sound. I, I put the headphones not to have any sound. <laughs> you know, to me, I really want in this kind of, I wanted to, to see how you can experience really silence because people go to the exhibitions and all what they do, they talk or they look in the phones or they interact it or there's always some kind of sound elements here and there and all the other people have, you know, hear the other people in conversations. But if you're in total silence and absence of any other sound, you have this concentration that is necessary. But if the work is a sound piece, that's something else, you know, then you, you don't need headphones. <laughs> you have to listen to the sound. But in my case, I'm interested now in the silent, very simple silent places that actually sound is gone. I, I have this funny story with the, in, in 512 hours in Serpentine, when I give to the first kid who 12 years old, the sound, the, 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 the headphones, he look at me and say, but they don't work. I said, of course they don't work. This is a silence. They're actually to give you silence. The kid was so impressed that he ran and bring next day entire kids from school. 20 of them came to listen to silence. They never heard before. It's so important sometimes, you know, to actually not have the sound. We, we are constantly living in sound pollution, in visual pollution, the consumption pollution, art pollution, too many pollutions. Mm -hmm. 
And to move into the next question, um, which is what advice can you give to young artists, Marina, in this world of globalization and the internet, where it seems that everything is already existing? Should it be an aim to create something new? You know, you always create something new if you're true to yourself. But you have to go deep inside yourself. If you start looking what is around, you constantly have the visual pollution and, uh, you know, and you will just repeat whatever other people are doing it. And, and you have to see, to me, it's always simple. The more deeper you go into yourself, the more universal you come to other side. And sometimes it's not about inventing new things. Sometimes it's about discovering ancient truths and putting, giving the new light. So it's it's uh, the young artist. It's it's so important important to, you know, to be true to himself. And the first question, of course, you have to ask yourself: Are you an artist? Maybe you're not. And if you're really an artist, are you ready to sacrifice everything? Are you ready that that this is the most thing important in your life? That you put all your attention to creating, and uh, and what you're creating have to have, you know, meaning and have to give something to society. You know, it's really complicated. Being an artist, not easy. Being an artist is okay, but being, you know, really great artist and artists who don't compromise, that's all new thing. But for young artists, I will I will really, you know, ask them first question, how you know you're an artist? What makes you an artist? Do you do you need to create and is more important than your breathing? Or you 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 don't question breathing, you you have to create. Mm-hmm. Or what is happening with, with your uh, with ideas? What you, what you know? What what you're going to choose to make? I was so lucky to choose my body in the beginning because so many artists takes a lifetime to choose which media actually can express their work. Is the video? Is the writing? Is the film? Is the mixed media? Is the painting? Is the drawings? You have to look for what are you first. Not easy, mm. but you have to be true to yourself. That's all. Wonderful advice for artists and everyone else too. This question is from Diddley, uh, which is- By the way, by the way wait, wait, two more things. Oh. Don't compromise and don't be afraid of anybody and anything. Two things. It's now. true. Don't compromise. Don't be afraid of anybody or anything. And this question, next question is, um, related about to being afraid. In one room at Modern Oxford, visitors are asked to face the wall. This reminded me of a school punishment. Was Marina thinking about punishment, and was she aware of this school tradition in uh, this? Yeah, this tradition in schools of facing the wall for punishment. No, we never actually face the wall to punish. We're in communism. They just slap you in the face. Much worse, <laughs> no. And then, and then you go home, and then your mother slapped you more. So I didn't. I've been slapped a lot around and and punished, but not not facing the wall. To me, the wall is incredible. The wall is the is like is like it's like a film, you know, just projecting from your head into the white wall. I mean, in my house right now, I'm living. I never put anything on the wall. I never put paintings, posters, uh, drawings, nothing, no art. The, because you have so much here and you and you need empty wall to empty yourself into this empty wall. And actually to me, it's like, like a movie, not punishing at all. It's actually, actually really getting together with yourself, understanding where you're standing, understanding gravitation, understanding your breathing, where is your heart, you know, where is your mind. It's kind of a beautiful moment looking to white wall. No mm. punishment at all. And you'd mentioned as well when we were talking previously, and it's also uh, discussed in the book uh, with Claire Harris, about you learning different techniques for performance and learning from people in spiritual and religious settings, prostrating themselves for long periods of time in particular positions in order for the self to transition, the consciousness to transition you speak a little about that because that's within that idea of staring at the wall or facing the wall too right? 
I mean, you know, it's very simple. The old Zen tradition, you're facing white wall for a long period of time and you fall asleep. You have the monk who have the little stick and just, you know, hit you on your back in order to straight your back and to wake up and continue looking at the white wall. I mean, there's so many incredible techniques to that, to, you know, for concentration. I mean, one of the old Sufi method, you're going, either wake you four in the morning in, in, in the middle of autumn and the, there is a wind and the leaves are falling on the ground all the time and you have to pick up the leaves for hours and hours and hours. It's a completely, uh, the, the, the kind of um, action who is no logic at all, but that no logic have to kind of create some kind of uh, blockages your rational mind in order to open to another state of the reality. So there are so many techniques, you know, that, that people have. I mean, not even to mention the, the, the Tibetans who go to the, to the caves and stay there for 10 years without seeing anybody and have only monastery monks giving the food once a day in the front of the cave and they don't even see them because they just leave it in the front. And it's really incredible, amazing stuff that people can understand and how to control the body and mind. You know, body is, you can control, but mind is the most difficult. Mind is the most difficult at all. You know, to me, like if you think about pains, body pain, you can find the technique how to control and overcome. But emotional pain, good luck, that's that's really difficult. And all these techniques serving that purpose, you know, and then you come to the point that you really understand, you know, reality, understand who you are, you understand, you understand, you know, mortality of your being, and that you are here just for the moment of this planet. All of these big truths, you know, it's, it's, and then you understand how many times for the complete shit and bullshit, we lose our time for nothing. We, th this kind of techniques learn you to have the big picture, the, the really cosmic picture of the universe, of our planet, or ourselves. And we have got three more questions left, which link really nicely to that point you were just making as well. So um, the first is from Bianca, who says, hello, Marina, I'm happy to see you. And I'll be in the next Cleaning the House edition at the Marina Abramovich Institute in Greece, which is coming up soon, which is brilliant. Uh, she, she, she says, I'm so impatient to experiment with your method. Do you have any advice or something to say about the method? And I'm going to link this to the next question as well, which is from Lena. And Lena asks, for people who cannot access the exhibition, how could one experience something similar to the space you've created, which links back to the Marina Abramovich method? So would you speak to that? So we have now the, the the place in Greece which is in the mountain and it's two and a half hours from the from the aeroport and there is a, in in the mountain who is a really big archaeological site but also surrounded by the by the by the forest away from the sea away from everything pretty isolated and uh, my advice to you to bring good shoes and, uh, and uh, you know close warm because it's cold right now because it's even snowing and I don't want to advise anything. I have to just go and surrender and see what happened and then talk to me after. Because I, it's not about advising. It's about being open and say, okay, I will have these seven days of something that I want to experiment. So go and experience. Don't don't ask anything before. Really, there's nothing to ask. It's like, it's like you're going to see the movie and they tell you who is the, what is happening on the end. I mean, go see the movie and the end will come to you. <laughs> and the piece, the question about experiencing something similar to the exhibition, um, I mean, since 1972, Definitely. really, your work's been... Mm. Your work's been very based around instruction. So there's that kind of making the frame for something. That's And some of your instruction works are online and available. Um, and also mentioned to Lena too that one of the things in the exhibition that's really noticeable is there's a kind of a love and a trust and an acceptance of going into the experience so if you were to recreate something or do some of the Marina Abramovich method at home that kind of kindness and tenderness that Marina mentioned at the beginning but is there is really important. a very simple Abramovich method cards were playful 
And there are also two cards who are actually jokers, and they, you can invent your own your own method that is able that you can follow. But these cards are really you can pick up just blindfold it yourself and just pick up one card from the deck and do the exercise. There are many many exercises there, including hugging the tree, sitting in the silence, uh, you know, counting the rice, all kinds of stuff. So you can choose any of the method, but they really do it. You know, do it and see what happened. And and I think that's the true experience because they helped me. And this is why I made them for everybody else. Thank you. And Maria asks, um, I'm 19. I'm a Portuguese young artist. What was your relationship with spirituality when you were my age? So 19 years old. I was so interesting in everything. I I was I had a, you know a group of friends who was always kind of um, uh, sharing books between each other. Music. I was interested in classic music. I was interested in Bach. I was interested in Kierkegaard. I was interested in uh, in the in Zen Buddhism. I was interested in the in all this shamanism. I mean, everything that I could, you know, had the hands on, you know, I, in different people are interested in different things. Some people like more, more the, I don't know, uh, horror movies or, or, or they like movie or they like uh, uh, novels to read. I was all about search for the kind of spiritual quest. And there are so many interesting books. Uh, Gorgiev was another one. Uh, I was interested in Madame Blavatsky. I was interested in the, theology you know just uh, the 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 people who are exploring and uh, finding the truth around the world i i don't know i had a huge library i was just always looking and exchanging books with the friends that's what i've been doing but i was already like this when i was 15 14 16 17 oof 19 is already old <laughs> <laughs> But, but, you know, read, just read everything. Read and open your mind and travel. This is another device. People always think it's expensive traveling, but actually it's not. It's cheaper to travel. I, I mean, I just in Thailand, you can rent in Bangkok the room for 10 days, which is something like 50 pounds per 10 days that you can't have anywhere else in London. You know, people should not be afraid to experiment and travel. It's very important. Just look this world. Look the world. The planet is not that big as we think. You know, I, I still didn't, didn't be in all the places I want to. But to me, to, to have, to understand the planet is our studio. It's important. And this could be end. Planet is the studio. The planet is the studio. There's one, there's another question. <laughs> Sorry, they're still coming in. Um, yeah, well, this is a rather lovely one, which is uh, you brought performance to a new this level of art. This last question? Yes, can be. Yeah. Okay, last. Yeah. Yeah. You brought performance to a new level of art. How do you think the future of art will look? And what are your future projects and plans? And do you see a potential in digital art? This is three questions. You say only it is. One. It's essentially asking. Well, that's three questions in their one question. But the digital art and some of your uh, ambitions and experiments with that could be interesting to hear about. Yeah, but I done already. I done NFT. I done, uh, you know, the 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 one experiment with uh, uh, mixed reality. And uh, you know, it's for me. I'm interested in everything. You know, I don't. It, it's. I think that that still in digital art. Nobody made a great piece yet, but I think it's too early. I think we have to more experiment to find this media uh, useful for art. And uh, and I don't know, you know, I I I don't know what's going to be my future. I just like to to have open mind for everything. I'm now working on this big show in Royal Academy, and then after I. I will see what is going to happen. My opera is touring. I'm interested to make another work really relating much more to my own, the background, you know, the Balkan. Uh, that could be a new piece that I'm building in my mind, but I will not start working before next year. I am very important to me. I'm teaching now Pina Bausch class in Essen. I'm working with 26 students. They are doing long duration performance work. I'm interested in my in my uh, the you know institute how that actually that the young artists can learn what is long durational and how we can teach them to make their own work. Plenty of stuff to do. 
And uh, and a future of art for me is art without any object. It's just direct transmission of energy. But I said this already last century, and it's, it looks like the the what is happening with digital art is exactly that. It's become more and more immaterial, and we don't know. Let's see future brings. I can't predict the future. Nobody can. Thank you so much, Marina. We'll leave it there with the whole planet Earth as one studio and <laughs> living hope. in the present. Get a good ending. Okay. And the yeah. question was wonderful. Thank you, everybody who asked these questions. It really it was important to me to answer. I enjoy every of them, everyone. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks but all for watching. The last statement, the last statement will be, please remember, you have to do more and more of less and less. We always do too much. We should do less and less. Bye.